شريكة له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله The brothers that I was in the film were tried to suffer from very severe migraine syndrome so I've been having a really bad one today so bear with me if it takes a little while for me to get my thoughts going and get there inshallah and behind them. The topic of my talk, again, is one that I don't have enough time for, unfortunately, but I will try to do the best that I can with the time that I have inshallah and behind We're going to talk about the reward of da'wah. The, the answer and the thawab that you get from da'wah. Yesterday we talked about da'wah and its importance, its significance, its fact that it is mandatory. But what are you going to get out of it? This is what we need to understand. Because one thing that we do know about human beings is that we have a tendency to be selfish. We have a tendency to want things. We have a tendency to very seldomly do things with nothing in return. This is just reality. This is the human nature. Nafsi, nafsi. This is the reality. We want what we want. And it is okay in certain circumstances. For instance, the desire of the believer for Jannah. You're allowed to be selfish for this. You're allowed to have this desire. You're allowed to do good deeds for this desire. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Da'wah, hopefully, insha'Allah ta'ala, by the end of my talk, you will understand not only how important it is from yesterday, but how much you're missing out when you don't get involved. How much you're missing out when you don't get involved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in His most noble book, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, وَمَنْ أَحْسُنُوا قَوْلًا مِمَنْ دَعِيَ لَاللَّهُ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَةً وَقَالَ الْإِنَّنِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who can be better? Allah asks a question, وَمَنْ أَحْسُنُوا Who can be better? And this question is rhetorical. When Allah asks questions in this manner, it's a rhetorical question, means that Allah doesn't want you to answer it. He's trying to tell you something through the question. Through the question, a rhetorical question is a question that is used in order to catch the reader's attention or the listener's attention in order to emphasize the importance of what is being said. So Allah is asking who is better than one whose speech is calling to Allah? Who can be better than one whose speech is calling to Allah while they themselves are doers of good and they proclaim and say to the people indeed I am a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. So if Allah is saying who can be better or what speech can be better, however this is interpreted differently, who can be better or what speech can be better than one whose speech is calling to Allah, then the answer is in the question, meaning nobody, no one. Meaning that there is no speech better than this speech. There is no one better than these people who are out on the forefront, on the front lines calling other people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a very beautiful man in our history from our Salaf whose name was Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala, the greatest student of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. And Ibn al-Qayyim was a man who could delve deep, deep into the matters of the deen, into the matters of the heart, into the matters of psychology, etc. He's a very deep man. And he wrote about the ghuraba, the strangers in the sifatul ghuraba, the qualities of strangeness in Islam that are praiseworthy. And he talked about three levels of strangeness, each of them greater than the next. And he said that because everyone wants to be part of the ghuraba, the Prophet said, Ba'du Islam gharibin. Uh, that Islam began as a strange thing, would go back to being a strange thing. So Tuba, which is actually a tree in Jannah, Jannah is for those strangers. The companions asked a question which we don't have time for today, which actually 
answers, they said, وَمَنْهُمْ And the Prophet ﷺ said that the strangers are those who when they see people falling into corruption, they correct them. They change society. They make things happen. They better their people. But when talking about the qualities of strangeness in Islam, Ibn Al-Qaim gave three different levels. He said that the first level, and today, I want you to ask yourself, which level do you find yourself? He said that the entry level to strangeness to these ghuraba is Islam. Is Islam. That just because you are a Muslim, you're going to be a stranger in the world no matter what. Even if you're marginally Muslim, barely Muslim, barely hanging on to your Islam. But if you claim to be a Muslim and you claim to other people that you're a Muslim, you're always going to be a stranger. Always. This is the way it is. This is just the reality. You'll be a stranger to everyone else. And they will never be satisfied with anything that you do. Give that up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, they will never be pleased with you until you do what? You become one of them. They will never be pleased with you until you become one of them. So thinking that you can be a Muslim and please Allah and please all of the people all of the time, you are only beating your head against the wall. It's never going to be possible. Allah has already promised this is not possible. But this is the entry level into strangeness and this is the lowest level that every Muslim inhabits. Everybody who claims Islam inhabits this level. He said, but above this level is another level of people who not only claim Islam and they're Muslim through the testimony of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, but they also strive to live their lives according to the kitab of Allah, the Qur'an, and the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, these people are strangers amongst the strangers. Because not only are they Muslims, but they are striving to live according to the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of us have probably either been in that situation or seen that situation when you have someone who wants to start practicing deen, maybe they didn't practice for a long time, maybe their family is not so practicing, and they decide they want to start implementing Islam. The sister maybe wants to start covering properly now. The brother wants to grow his beard, he wants to start going to the masjid regularly, etc. And you have his friends or his family or her friends or her family say, hold on, whatever, what are you doing? You're a Muslim, wasn't that enough? Now you have to do all of this other stuff. Now you have to cover like this, you have to put this trash bag on your head and you have to, you know, go to the masjid and look like an extremist. Just, just calm down. Just calm down. Don't be, don't be too extreme. How many of you have ever heard that happening before? Raise your hand. Families or friends being a problem when you want to start practicing. Yeah, it happens. It happens more than you would, would guess. But also know that with family, Family has always been a struggle with the Anbiya. All the way starting with Nuh salam, struggled with his family. Ibrahim struggled with his father. It's always been our Prophet salam, struggled with his family. So it's there. He said, but these people become strangers even to the Muslims. And they're smaller in number. And these people hold a greater reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are people who will find it easier to enter into Al-Jannah. Insha'Allah ta'ala. He said, but this is the second level. He said, then there's a third level, which is the pinnacle of strangeness and it is inhabited by the fewest of people. It is inhabited by the fewest of people. He said that third level are the people who not only claim to be Muslim, they not only try to live their lives according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, but now they actively go out and try to get other people to do that. They are the ones who go out and try to bring other people to Islam. They are the ones who go out and try to bring other Muslims back to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. These are the du'at. He said, these are the strangers amongst the strangers amongst the strangers. And they are the fewest people on this earth. He said, but they inhabit a very special place within the deen. And they inhabit a very special place on earth. He said, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Hud that the people of Hud, He would not have destroyed the people of this time if only there had been a warner amongst them. If only there was a warner, I would not have destroyed them. And our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, 
said that Allah had promised him that as long as he was with them and along the warner was with them, that he would not destroy the people. You see, it's not until there's no more people warning. If you look at the people of Lut, when Lut gave up and said, that's it, there's nobody else to warn those people, Allah destroyed them. The same with the people of Ad and the people of Thamud. When their people stopped warning each other and reminding each other of Allah and giving the da'wah, Allah destroyed them. He said, so these du'at are the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors because He withholds His wrath from the rest of mankind for them, for their sake. Because they're out trying to actively change things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, that there must be always a group of this ummah. There's always needs to be a group of you who are doing da'wah ila al-khair. They are calling to good. They are calling people to do good. And what is khair? Khair is known from the scholars is that which is known amongst the majority of humanity to be good. The things which are good. Things which are good. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ta'maruna bil ma'rufi wa ta'ana lil munkar. They are doing, calling to what is good, they are forbidding what is evil. And Allah says about these people, Ula'ika humul muflihun. These are the people that will be successful. You see, we all want to be successful. Who in this room does not want to be successful? Raise your hand. You want to be a failure. You want to be a loser. No, we don't want to be losers. We want to be successful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that these people, this group of people, these are the people He is guaranteeing that they will be successful. It's so clear, the rewards of da'wah throughout the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. Had I had the time, we could spend hours on this, hours on this. When I give da'wah workshops, we spend half a day just on the rewards of da'wah and what it can bring you. And I'm only giving you a small snippet of it. And then I just want to have some real talk with you for a moment because... I'm going to be short today. Our Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he said, and this is recorded in the collection of Imam Muslim, if I'm not mistaken, whosoever calls to guidance, whosoever calls to guidance, meaning <clears throat> whoever goes out and calls other people to Islam, they give da'wah. They call other people, قُلْ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ تُفْلِحُونَ Say there's no God but Allah and you will be successful. The Prophet والسلام, said, those people receive the reward. This one is the one that's going to shock you. They receive the reward of the one who is guided without the reward of that guided one being lost. Let me explain to you what was just said. The Prophet والسلام, and <clears throat> this is one of the things that have kept me going for so long, for 10 years, for 10 years. Because let me tell you something about da'wah. Let me tell you something about being a, a public speaker. A lot of people come to you and they think they tell oh, you have the most beautiful life. You get to travel the world, you know, you get to see so many countries, you get to stand on stages, you're on TV. You must have like a movie star lifestyle. Let me tell you something. It's it's not what it seems to be. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Behind what you see on the front, which is the, the good part, the fun part of this da'wah, which is the most beneficial part of it, you have all the things behind the scenes. You have all the fitna that these du'at go through. You have all the struggles that they go through. All the, all the hardships. Shaitan makes them public enemy number one. You see, they're out trying to change the world, so shaitan makes a, a, a direct uh, uh, effort on their lives. There's a lot of struggles. Ask any speaker. If they want to be real with you, they'll tell you. One thing, if I could go back 10 years when I started this whole thing and I could change, it would be anybody ever knowing my name. Wallahi azim. I would take it all back. And if it could be sold, I would sell it very cheaply. I'd give it for free because it's not worth much. You see, the da'wah is what's important, spreading the deen. Not about who knows you and who doesn't know you. Because at the end of the day, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't favor and honor you and accept it, none of you can help me. None of you can help me. But the Prophet ﷺ said, if you give da'wah to someone and they accept Islam, and they accept Islam, even though it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has opened their breast, part of that guidance is from you, Hidayatul Irshad, your responsibility to guide people through the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that person accepts Islam, then they start doing good deeds they get rewarded for, correct? If that person prays, don't they get good deeds? 
Guess who else gets good deeds for what they do? You do. If they pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts it as if you prayed. Because you've called them to this. If they fast, Allah counts it as if you fasted. If they give in charity, Allah counts it as if you've given in charity. Every good action that they do, you get one similar to it. And they don't lose any of theirs. Think about that for a moment. You get what they get. So now you have an, a, 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 an extra one of you doing good deeds. And now let's say that person goes and gives da'wah to two people and they accept Islam. He's going to get the reward of those two people. Guess who else is going to get the reward of those two people? You. It's going to trickle its way up because you are the beginning result of that. You see, this ajr can continue and continue and continue. And with all of these Muslims throughout the world today, guess who's getting every single bit of that reward? Guess where that final line stops? In this ummah. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah. Imagine someone like the Egyptian guy who gave Yusuf Estes da'wah. Yeah, just some businessman. I've met him a few times. Just a businessman. He was just a simple business guy. And he didn't even really in, intend initially to give Yusuf Estes da'wah. But since him and his uh, uh, brother, they were on him trying to get him to become a Christian. He said, look, okay, I got I to gotta defend myself. So he was defensive da'wah. And through that, Estes became a Muslim. How many people has that man given shahada to? Till today. How many people has that man given shahada to today? I don't think I've seen too many videos where that man's not telling someone to say, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. Imagine what this Egyptian guy, the amount of ajr that is rolling into his account in the akhirah. When I met him, I said, Akhi, basically, you can do your mandatory actions and you can relax, man. You can chill out. You got a legion, you got to have an army of people doing good deeds for you. I don't know how much ajr this man has. But this is the reward that Allah gives for this because this is how much he loves it. This is how much Allah loves those who go forward and give the da'wah. This is why the Anbiya were so honored in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why He gave them special position and rank and help and victories. Because of their position to carry the message of Tawheed to the world. Now there are no more Anbiya. So who is it that Allah is going to favor on earth doing that job now? The du'at. The people out there doing what the Anbiya did. The people out there on the front lines between Haq and Batr trying to make a distinction, trying to bring people from one side to the other. This is the war that's going on in the world today. It's the real war. It's a war of Haq and Batr right now. Because everybody's confused. <laughs> Even people who think they know what they're doing, they are confused. You look around and see what's going on. Confusion, lack of knowledge, ignorance is overwhelmingly widespread amongst this ummah. Doing actions without knowing what it is we're doing. So, we need to do some work. That guy, who was a drug dealer, who gave me, he didn't give me my shahada, but he became the vehicle through which I entered Islam. He became the person who was responsible for me to seek out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this deen. Drug dealer. If you've heard my story before, you'll know that he wasn't even there when I took my shahada because he got arrested. And I haven't seen him since. I haven't seen him since. But every time this traveling the world thing and this whole da'wah thing becomes a bit much on me and shaitan's really bothering my life, and I think about, okay, maybe I should just take a step back, let shaitan mess with some of you guys for a minute. I always think of that brother. I always think about him and say, no, no, no. I have some work to do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I owe him. I owe this brother right here to bring more people to this deen insha'Allah ta'ala to get more good deeds for him. Because I don't know how he will end his life. But one thing that I've always made dua for is that I sincerely hope if I never meet this brother ever again, I sincerely make dua that he leaves this life upon deen, upon Islam. And I'm hoping that I can have a nice surprise waiting for him on the day of Qiyamah. I'm hoping that he can become before Allah knowing all of those bad things that he did. 
knowing all of those sins, he's going to know it's over for me. I'm done. Book is filled with nonsense. And then there's a question that can be asked when his scale is being weighed. You know, when you put the good deeds and the bad deeds, when the caller calls out, is there anything else? I hope that mountains of deeds can start being put on his scale, that this one and that one. And he's asking, I don't know, where did this come from? One person couldn't even do all of this in a lifetime. And then it tips the scale in his favor and he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where did all of this come from? And then maybe Allah azza wa jal can remind him, you remember that day when you told that young man to go to Juma? You remember that? Because of that, all of this happened. And you get to go to Jannah. And I hope to give him a big hug one day. And thank him for what he gave me. This is why I do what I do. Because I understand, unlike many of you, I've been on the other side of the fence. Unlike many of you, I've been lost. I know what it's like to be lost. I know what it's like to not know that life has any purpose or any reason whatsoever. Ready to give up on life. Ready to just live my life however I want to live it until the day I die. However I die and I didn't really care. I know what that's like. To be at the end of your rope. And then all of a sudden, a light is put in front of you. And that light becomes so beautiful that you desire nothing more than that. That becomes the most beloved thing to you in your life. I know what that feels like. And every day, even though I've been Muslim for 15 years now, alhamdulillah, every day I try to remind myself of that. When I feel lazy, when I feel like not worshiping Allah the way I used to, I try to remind myself of that. That you weren't like this one day. There was a time you didn't have this. There was a time that this was not yours. And it was gifted to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have some payback to do. This is why we are giving da'wah, because we owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I told you yesterday that Allah wrote, you, wrote for you to be a Muslim before you existed. This is why we are slaves. You're in debt. You can never repay your debt to Allah. Because every day that you live, you go deeper into that debt. You go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And I don't care how much good deeds you do. Let me tell you something right now. I don't care how many good deeds you do. You can't use them to get into Jannah. You can't. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, and this is narrated in Imam Muslim by Abu Hurair radiallahu an, he said, let none of you think, don't let any of you think that by doing good deeds, you'll go to paradise. None of you think that. They said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, not even me. Unless Allah forgives me. Not even me unless Allah forgives me. I don't care if you took every good deed of every single human being that ever existed on the face of the earth. And on the day of judgment, you gave them to one person, all of them, and told that person, go before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those good deeds of all human beings and repay him for your vision. Repay him for your heart. Repay him for the air he let you breathe. Do you think you would have enough? You wouldn't have enough. So how do you think you're going to buy your way into Jannah? It's not possible. It's not possible. There's only one way you're going to make it into Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it many times in the Quran. One beautiful place is in Surah Al-Saf. Where Allah azza wa jal says, Ya yuhal ladheena amanu hal adulukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min adhabin aleem. O oh, you who believe, can I guide you to a tijara, a business, upon which I will avoid punishing you painfully? And then Allah says, تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سِبِلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَلِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ That you believe in Allah and His Messenger and you strive hard for Him. You work hard for Him, you sacrifice for Him. Everything you do, you do it for the sake of Allah alone. That is better for you if you only understood it. And then Allah says in the next verse, يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبُكُمْ Then Allah will forgive you of your sins وَيُدْخِلْ jannah And give you into, into paradise. You see, the key to paradise, the price, ثَمَّنْ jannah, The price to enter paradise is not your good deeds. It's Allah forgiving what you didn't do. It's Allah forgiving you for the mistakes that you made. It's Allah forgiving you for the sins and all of the errors and the wrong. That's where you enter into paradise. That's what we strive for. 
Because your good deeds will never be enough. They will never be enough. So we strive and struggle in this dunya so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive us when we make mistakes. And if you want to supercharge your good deeds, if you want to put your record of goods on, 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 on a speed roll, get involved in da'wah. Get involved. Trust me. It's one of those things that the reward is unknown. It's an unknown. You never know. You, you don't have any idea. Right now, I have no idea. After this, inshallah ta'ala, I plan to meet a young man who says he accepted Islam because of watching my video. See, this is why I do this. These are the people I want to meet. Because this man is carrying my good deeds. If I die today, I'm going to tell him, look, come on, man. Help me out. If I die tomorrow, I need you to keep doing what you're doing. Help me out. See, this is why we do it. This is what it's all about. This is the reward of Jannah. I mean, this is the reward of Da'wah. You never know. You never know what these young men can do. This young man could go on and do many things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can write as if I did it. As I bring my lecture to a close, because we have something special for you guys after this, inshaAllah ta'ala. And this will be my final time on the stage here in Kenya for this trip, inshaAllah ta'ala. Inshaallah, I'll be back. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes it for me, I'll be back. But I want all of you, all of you to be grateful and to be thankful for who you are. Never, ever, ever feel humiliated. Never, ever feel despair. Never, ever feel sadness. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed ma'ana. He's with us. We're Muslims. We have what no one has. We have a gift that cannot be bought. We have a gift that can't be sold, it can't be traded, it can't be bartered for. It is a gift that is only given to special people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever reason He chooses, wills for them to have this gift. And you carry it with you everywhere that you go. It is the most beautiful thing that will ever come into your life. Never undervalue it. Never take it for granted. Never ever let it go because you will be sorry for it. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity and I look forward to being with you all again at some point into the future. Until then, I leave you with salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhum.